So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah. Um, thank you for being here so early this morning, or relatively early. Um, what I'm actually delighting in is the pleasure of seeing human faces without the mask. And that, that's an achievement in itself um, for, for, our, for my own sense of humanity. Um, are we mostly students here? Yeah? A gentle wave, a, a hello wave to the students. <laughs> Um, especially you young people, the, the, the young students. Um, I, I will go back to the for kind of the formal presentation. It's in two parts, a, a death by PowerPoint and a, a brief introductory reading of the Dragonfly Sea. And if we have a little extra time, um, introduction, um, a video introduction, a video that was produced um, in Kenya uh, featuring some of the things we've talked about. Um, but I was ad addressing you, especially you, the young students. You have moved. We have moved into an epoch that centralizes the what some of you call the Indian Ocean. I, st I call it now the Swahili Sea, uh, only to only to make it a little bit controversial. Um, I think, as a member of the older generation, I should apologize first of all for the mess that you you'll, you'll be inheriting, um, but also to. Um, and invite you to take seriously the journey um, that's going to be inflicted upon your life. You've heard a lot about the Indo-Pacific, um, and, unf and, and unfortunately the rhetoric built around that is a rhetoric of violence, brutality, and the, and the hint of war. It was not always like this, and these are things that we're going to talk about. So this is both an invitation, especially to the young ones, and, uh, and an apology. <laughs> Um, okay, let's let's get on with this. Um, the dragonfly sea. Part of, part of the challenge, uh, I'll also, um, Natasha, I'm going. I was going to ask, say that. Um, contemplate the idea of a lexicon for our seas, another language, another uh, a wall of words for the sense of our seas um, beyond, the, uh, beyond, the, beyond the rhetoric and beyond the words that we've come to accept that have in so many ways served to only limit and constrain our ideas of what these waters are. Um, are, are is everybody here a sea lover? Is there anybody who hates the sea with all their hearts? <laughs> um, I'm just curious, what are some of the names for the sea? What some of what are some of the names? Just throw out some words. What, some, what are some names for the sea that you have? Ocean, Pacific, Samudra, and that's from Samunda. Samunda, interesting. Yes. Water. What else? La mer. Oui, la mer. Oh, beautiful. Where is that from? St. Helies. What the? Okay, I'm going to, I should rush. Actually, I wish we had a chart. It would be nice to just get these words down. <laughs> okay, I need to acquire those words. Any other ones? Isn't there a Dutch word? Say. <laughs> How do you spell that? Yeah. Z A C. Z. <laughs> Any other ones? Ma, yes, that's Spanish. Pada, that's Hangul. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm. As you can see, it's it's um, and in, in each one, I think what's so amazing is that in each one of these words, there are histories embedded. These are not just mere words. Um, there's the Swahili Bahari. Um, linked to the Arabic Baha, the assumption is always that it's the Arabs that gave the word, but there's actually a, a realized possibility that the Swahili are the ones who gave the word Bahari as a loan word to the Arabic language. But what I'm saying is that there are in, in, incredible and entire histories embedded in the, in, in, in the word, the mar, la mer. Um, if, we, if we ever wanted to look into the etymologies, how did these words come about? You'd be amazed at what worlds suddenly explode, right? <clears throat> the dragonfly sea. 
um, a prologue which uh, um, uh, Natasha referred to, what, what the map cuts up, the story cuts across. So the first part is a prologue. Why the dragonfly? This particular one, the globe skimmer, is probably the most widespread dragonfly species, dragonfly, spe dragonfly species in the world. It is cosmopolitan, occurring in, all, occurring in all continents. It's a sea migrant, an endurance baby. It's complex, it's mysterious. And think about it, and this is now where the, 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 this little creature becomes particularly important for, for um, our Indian Ocean or our Afrasian Sea. The longest migration, the longest animal migration, creature migration in the world, is that of this golden skimmer that starts off in India and uh, ends up in my part of the world, uh, having traversed over 2,000 uh, 2, uh, kilometers and uh, ends up on the back of, of, of rain, a short season of rain. So it's always associated with, with good news in my part of the world in, in, in what you call the autumn in October. Um, and it's actually the fourth generation. So when it sets up in India, it's the fourth generation uh, a dragonfly uh, that appears uh, riding the wind. And what's so fascinating about that migration, when the dragonflies start to migrate, around that time, um, kind of halfway, the, the migrating birds from Europe also start to move. So as they're moving in up to our part of the world, what they have over the ocean, um, riding the winds, is a snack, is a dragonfly snack. <laughs> Um, so they, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's it, when you when you enter into that space of the movement of the of 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 creatures across the across our, our, our magnificent ocean, um, it's it's an it's a whole other world. It's an incredible micro macro world happening right there, and has happened for millions of years. And 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 the, I use the dragonfly in many ways as a, a placemaker. Uh, site maker, because one of the most uh, controversial aspects linked to these particular waters is the naming. What we call the Indian Ocean was only be only called the Indian Ocean in 1515. Um, the the result of the fantasy of mostly the Europeans who happened upon those waters rather late, but were preoccupied with a fantasy idea of India. And uh, because of naming protocols, um, uh, the, the waters that were known by many, many, many other names, including you know, th the names that were presented to us, and, and there are a few others that I'll share with you, um, becomes enshrined as Indian Ocean. Um, so with, with the new contestations, I promise you this, you're going to find all sorts of um, our protests and objections about the names arising and emerging. Um, just so that you're prepared for it. Um, and I, I too, as an East African, I'll be throwing in my stake out of pure mischief and malice. So I'm insisting on Swahili seas. Um, now, so, but think about the marvel of this. It, it, this thing is only about five, five centimeters long, weighs under 300 grams, and traversing the ocean in the way that it does. It's, 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 the story itself just was so, just kind of blew my mind. Um, and of course, it's now the subject of so a, a lot of research going on right now. But it's in our parts of the world, and when I say our parts, those those of our worlds that are linked to this particular sea, and these are immense, immense worlds which you're going to see. It's associated with good potence, and it's associated with good luck, except in, except in. Europe. That's you know when I when I when I was, when I was reading the names that the, the stories associated with the dragonfly, I thought we're really very different people. So, <laughs> in Europe, they were treated as em uh, emblematic of one form of evil or ill will or another. The Swedish folklore holds that the devil uses dragonflies to weigh people's souls. Norwegians name it eye poker. Uh, the, Portu the Portuguese used to call it eye snatcher. <laughs> Just so that, uh, uh, again, uh, and of course I will, I'll, keep, I'll, I'll be provoking you with certain questions. Uh, the relationships we have with uh, uh, the, the little presences, the creatures um, that inform our, our uh, 
if, if you want, inform our lives and with which, with which we relate or share spaces like oceans. Um, not only say a lot about our own, um, uh, what do you call it, the way we name them also say a lot about our sense of that relationship, but also what these mean for us. Um, only in the interest of time, uh, because, just because I think I want to pack quite a bit, I was going to also say, what names do you have for the dragonfly uh, in, from the worlds in which you come? Um, and how are these associated with the water or with the sea? Do you know, do you, do you know the names of these dragonflies at all? I mean, are, are people aware of, um, uh, of the meaning of dragonflies within their own cultural spaces? Okay. It would be fun. I mean, if we had time, it would be a lot of fun uh, of what would, what would be uncovered. But again, one of the things we have in common in the worlds that we share, those of, us, uh, those of us who are in many ways reclaiming our old belongings to the global monsoon complex, the, the Afrasian Sea, the, the Silk Road, or whatever you want to call it, mm, are, are the, if you want, the, 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 the elements we have in common, uh, this is what this prologue is mostly about, um, the sense of what the dragonflies mean for us. As I said, Every time they show up in our parts of the world, they show up as potents of good luck because they come with the rain. They come with a short rain. So, before I go that, I said, I, saw, I told you there were placeholders for what is going to be the most contested waters in the world. Mm, it, it's a return to the past, but this time with all the world. And one of the things that will blow up is the ocean's most used name. Now, when I, well, about India and the Indian Ocean. Um, the Indian Ocean, as I, as I said, it has only been known that in 1515. The point I actually want to make is this. Um, although it is a matter of great pride to India right now to still have the ocean called Indian, by right, they should actually be the first to object, for they had other names for it. Ratnakara, Mahasaga, Samudra, which is a, a Sanskrit term meaning the gathering together of all the waters. Um, and it also is the name of Samudra Deva, the Hindu god of the ocean. Um, so, yeah, so I, like I said, um, there's so much that's going to emerge. Now, I, I quickly want to thank Natasha, as I said, for helping me correct a great wrong. Um, your note, Natasha, made me understand the reason, uh, part of the reason my whole spirit is very much steeped um, in, the, in especially or helping me reclaim the Africanity of these particular waters is because of Haji Gora Ho Haji. He died last year in June, uh, but his spirit has started the wandering, had started my own search. I would never have been able to write the book Dragonfly Sea without him and uh, this great sea whisperer. Uh, he was a, a fabulous man, an artist, a seer, a cosmopolitan in the sea sense. I want to be able to honor him. I, I want to dedicate this session to him uh, in gratitude, in love, and for blessing. And also because the character of Muhyiddin in my story is inspired by him. And he died before I could thank him. So, yes, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. He's the one who gave that line. You're looking for, uh, when I went to uh, when I went to research the book Dragonfly Sea. He said, "You're looking for the sea. You're looking you're, you're looking for you're looking for a map because I, you're looking for a map, my child." He says, "The sea is the map." Uh, it was such a simple yet profound uh, idea that uh, continues to to resonate to this particular moment for me. Some of the things we have in common in these particular waters, mangroves. Um, and the history of the mangrove trade is also old, ancient. Um, the boats that you see on the on the particular on, on our particular on, on these particular seas, the, especially the, the the most emblematic one, the Dao, um, built a, 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 you know from mangrove uh, mangrove wood. Um, and and uh, actually, without the mangrove, the the sense of travel. Uh, the centuries-old travel that in involving those particular seas would not have happened. Um, like I said, I'm throwing my name into the basket, but these are the names for this particular sea. Um, it's first kind of literary reference um, that when Europe encounters it is in the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, uh, when it's referred to as the Mars Eritrean, actually where Eritrea gets its name from. 
Okay, the things that have been said about it. Um, it's not one thing, this ocean of ours. So uh, it's the most complex and complicated. I know the previous uh, decades have dedicated their attention entirely to the Atlantic, but those of us who had to have the fortune of growing up by the Indian Ocean and being aware of its histories have found the Atlantic to be extremely dull. No, no offense to those who are Atlantic oriented, but really um, there is no way you can enter into the worlds of the Indian Ocean and be get, and not, not, not only get bored, but I should warn you, those of you who may be trying to go in, it's a rabbit hole. You'll go in and there's no way out. You, you, won't, you won't come out of it at all, at all. There's no way you can. Okay. And this is, you know, well, the Indian Ocean trade routes. Um, can somebody tell me why, how, why, especially even before proper navigational devices were available, does anyone know why particularly um, uh, trade was possible and, vib and vibrant uh, in these particular seas in a way that's unique. Uh, no other, a few other oceans and spaces provide. Try. Why? Okay, I'm going to pick on Indian Ocean. Yes, was that a hand? <laughs> You've heard of the monsoon? What, the, what these oceans had was the most, the most reliable of winds. Uh, the, the trade winds, that became known as the trade winds. Um, so you had, the, well, I'll use the Kiswahili words, the Kaskazi, they were reliable. The northeasterly would show up. And traders from um, this part of, well, not this part of the world, mostly the Asian worlds, um, would be able to come to East Africa. And then you had the in between seasons winds. Uh, which was a kind of transition wind, which would uh, allow uh, traders uh, and others to, you know, prepare their boats to return. And then you had the southeasterly from March, the end of September, uh, which was kind of like the return wind. And it was consistent and has been consistent and is still consistent um, uh, to this particular day. Of course, then the Dutch come in with, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, engineering techniques and boats that could sail against the winds. But this is why trade and cosmopolitanism and globalizations, but that actually did not involve Europe, unfolded in the what becomes known as the Indian Ocean, and did so for multiple centuries, for and and, and created these incredible linkages of encounter, of language, of cultures, of peoples, and 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 a, a trading goods, a trading goods and ideas. I will say, and I, I just wanted, these are images. I mean, like if we'd had more time, we'd go, I mean, this, it, this is just a story itself. Uh, the Mauliti Homu, Mutendani, uh, is a Zanzibari-based, uh, um, uh, how do you say it? Uh, it's both aesthetic, but also art, artistic performance. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's what, what simply happens, why I put it there is that it's music and it's dicker. It's, recitation um, is inspired by the winds, uh, the, the trade winds. Um, the songs that are, that are they saw, the songs, the static songs come from um, a static journey. So, you know, on the boat where you had to say prayer and things like that, if you were in a storm, it wasn't an excuse for you not to pray. You just chanted. Um, so it's moved now to the stage. Um, if, you, if you ever have time to, to look them up, Maulidia Homu, please do. You won't regret it. Um, okay, a similar a similar group also uh, are the Zar practitioners. This is Mazar here from Egypt. Again, Zar as a practice is inspired by specifically the winds of the ocean, winds of the Indian Ocean. Um, the and 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 each one of the winds has got, is associated with healing or transformation or transcendence. Each one of the winds is provided with a function, a character, and a name. And again, this also translated into um, a static dance uh, that's both uh, entertaining, but it's also about healing, therapeutic dance as well, uh, but also absolutely beautiful. So uh, again, the com when I say the complexities of relationships with this particular worlds uh, of the Indian Ocean, right? Um, I also wanted to point out uh, that that in East Africa, this, for the Swahili, the sea was not the, just the sea. The sea was a network, and the sea was associated with family homes. So, you know, each part of the territory, the, the mapping of the sea was mapped through um, associations with families. So you could map your way from... Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, from from Unguja, Zanzibar, um, to to, uh, to what do you call it, to the Malacca Straits, um, just you know, passing through human territories that were embedded and enshrined in the waters. Um, and again, when you hear the recitation of genealogies linked to the water, it again reveals a whole other idea of what, um, or how we how we think of the seas. Again, like I say, I'll just allude to it, but that itself is just a, a site of just profound Im imagination. Uh, you know, I know we're talking about, uh, uh, for example, the Swahili, and I know, for, especially for those of you who are in the. Um, who are coming from Europe, a lot of them, a lot of it may actually sound new. It shouldn't be new at all because um, linked to this particular history was uh, where, especially when the British and the Portuguese came around, um, they went into complete shock to realize that kind of life had been going on without them and going on, and going on quite successfully. So one of the major things they did was what you call, a, it was a vicious, brutal amputation of histories of agencies, right? Um, not, not, not to be, uh, well, uh, uh, I better not allude to it. I was going to refer to the amputations, the current kind of amputation that's going on with the, the kind of the Russian idea. But that kind of erasure of agency, so that in the end, every time you meet in the contemporary text, now when you meet the African, you only meet the African as cargo on somebody else's boat or as an, an artisanal fisherman fishing on the shoreline, terrified of the waters. So there's an incredible and profound erasure of both imaginary and agencies. And so when, 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 uh, when the world then opens up and people now find African communities in India, in Pakistan, in, in Iraq, in Iran, the Afro-Persians, Afro, all these Afro-Iraqis, they're immediately accorded the title of former slaves. And when, they, and when you meet them, especially, we, uh, well, I used to run the Zanzibar Film Festival and had the pleasure of hosting the Sidi Goma. And their own genealogies and histories speak of their going into these places as traders, as teachers, as soldiers, as mercenaries, as boat captains. But none of that, none of that is ever heard, right? So, I mean, part of I'm an artist, I write whatever, uh, whatever the muse brings to me, but my own involvement with the ocean um, comes because of the awareness. I, I, I didn't know either until I ended up working in Zanzibar. I was shocked by my own ignorance, uh, but also how much of the bullshit I had imbibed. But then that, that becomes part of my own, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, work. Not an activism as much as a ruin, a searcher of ruins. I go into ruins and excavate our dead um, and, and, and accord them once more. If they give me the permission, um, their right to speak, even if it's just one line, right? Mm, other names of the sea, so um, some of which we already talked about. So I'll just leap over that. Uh, how, much how much time do I have? Five minutes, huh? Ten, okay. This is okay, so uh, let me just jump over all of these. Uh, uh, there's the Dao. Uh, jump over that so that we can do the reading. Um, so very quickly, um, I set out to write this book uh, led by two, um, uh, uh, because of two quests. One was looking for a navigational poetry, the poem maps. Um, and the second was um, in response to, at that time, with all these, there was all these, the skies falling on Africa as I said, because China has come. Uh, but I was more interested now in what do the Africans actually say about China's return um, to its landscapes. And uh, Haji Gora Haji was particularly important for me in making peace with that particular question. Because he spoke of the human beings as the tide. People come, people go, people come, people go. Is there anything wrong with that? And I remember that actually just eased completely uh, my, my own anxieties, right? All right, so I'll jump over that. Um, 
Ah, I won't jump, jump too high over it. This is the Congo River. This is actually where this story started. Um, There's a story about the retiring, retiring of the last steamboat captain of the, of the, of the Makadi River, Matadi River, meaning that this was, a, this was the only captain that could, if you want, sing, that was the word they used, could sing a boat from the Congo River into the Atlantic without having to stop. Remember, the Congo is supposed to be completely unnavigable. But the Matadi River, the Matadi community have always been able to navigate the, 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 the Congo uh, from, the, from the river to the ocean. And when the boat captain, I was in the Congo at that time, and, and there was this commotion, I rush and say, what's happening? And I'm told, oh, he's retiring. And that's when they tell me the Matadi people sing the boat. They dance the boat from the, uh, what do you call it, from the Congo to the Atlantic. The French anthropologist used to say, oh, they are superstitious, they're singing to their gods. But it was only later on, because something had happened in Zanzibar that had confused me uh, several years back. It all came together in that moment. It was only then that we realized, oh my goodness, this is like satellite navigation. They don't just sing the boats, they are reciting maps. There's a map, and it's in poetic form. They don't just dance, but when you move this particular way, you're actually avoiding rocks. When you move this particular way, because the, it is incredible when, it, when that particular world unfolded. And the reason I'm stopping here briefly is that um, next week, the DRC is joining the East Africa community. After 300 years, uh, finally, the sea, the Atlantic, and the ocean are once more uh, connected across the African world. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's big. It may be a small thing for, for the rest of the world, but actually, it may, it may seem like a small thing, but it is really, really huge. Um, yeah, so the ocean. Uh, so we'll jump over that. That was part of the reason all the books that were out was how China is killing, is going to murder, suffocate, destroy Africa. All this nonsense. So, yeah. So let's give you uh, images of Pate Island. And then, um, uh, just very quickly, this girl, let me, I'll find a better picture of her. She, she sets me off. In 2005, Muamaka Sharifu, now Dr. Muamaka Sharifu, um, was picked up from this island that I'm going to read about, Pate Island. And based on DNA testing, and it shouldn't have even been surprised because, uh, surprise because Pate Islanders had always said it. It was only historians and geographers and every other idiot who knows better that had been denying it. Um, but based on DNA, it was, it was, pro it was proven that she had, um, uh, what do you call it, the ancestors. Uh, she had uh, the DNA of Chinese ancestors. The last voyage of the great admiral, Zheng He, um, I'm just going to skip that, him was off the coast of East Africa. He lost a third of his fleet in a terrible, terrible storm. Um, those, but the sailors, that some of the sailors that did survive ended up on this island called Pate Island. They settled down, got married, um, and kind of um, then were forgotten for a long, long time until in 2005, um, uh, this, uh, Mamaka was uh, sent to China. Uh, and it was a very poignant thing because it was also a return, the idea of the return of those who had been lost completely. I'm, I ended up meeting her last year for the first time. I wrote the book before meeting her. And this was, uh, this, someone captured the moment of our first meeting. So um, let me read for you, for you from the book um, and then it on. As you can just, yeah, yes, here, so he'll just let it run, okay. To cross the vast ocean to their south, water chasing dragonflies with four bears in northern India had hitched a ride on a sedate in between seasons morning wind, one of the monsoon's introits, the matlai. One day in 1992, four generations later, under dark purplish blue clouds, this fleeting being settled on the mangrove fringed southwest coast of a little girl's island. 
The Matlai conspired with a shimmering full moon to charge the island, its fishermen, prophets, traders, seamen, sea women, healers, shipbuilders, dreamers, tailors, madmen, teachers, mothers, and fathers with, the effect, with a fretfulness that mirrored the slow churning turquoise sea. Dusk stalked the Lamu archipelago's largest and sullenest island, trudging from Siu on the north coast, appending Kizengitini's fishing fleets, before swooping southwest to brood over a patted town that was already moldering in the malaise of unrequited yearnings. Bruised by endless deeds of guile, siege, war, and seduction, like the island that contained it, Pate, Isle, Pate Town marked melancholic time. A leaden sky poured dull red light over a crowd of petulant ghosts, dormant feuds, forfeited glories, invisible roads, and congealing millennia-old conspiracies. Weaker light leached into ancient crevices, tombs, and ruins, and signaled to a people who were willing to cohabit with tragedy, trusting that time transformed even cataclysms into echoes. Deep inside Pate, a, a cock crowed, and from the depths of space, a salmon's, the azan, crescendoed. Sea winds tugged at a little girl's lemon green headscarf, revealing dense black curly hair that blew into her eyes. From within her mangrove hideout, the scrawny seven-year-old, wearing an oversized floral dress that she was supposed to grow into, watched dense storm clouds hobble inland. She decided that these were a monster's footsteps, a monster whose strides left streaks of pink light on the sky. Sea water lapped at her knees and her bare feet sank into the black sand as she clutched another scrawny being, a purring, dirty white kitten. She was betting that the storm, her monster, would reach land before a passenger-laden dhow, now muddling its way towards the cracked wharf to the right of her. She held her breath. Homecomers, she called all passengers. Wajio. The child could rely on such homecomers to be jolted like marionettes where, where, whenever there was a hint of rain. She giggled in anticipation as the mid-sized dhow with beaky dooted painted in flaking yellow eased into the creek. Scattered soft raindrops. The thunder-spirited rumbling caused every homecomer to raise his or her eyes skyward and squawk like a hornbill. The watching girl sniggered as she stroked her kitten, pinching its fur in her thrill. It mewled. Shh, she whispered back as she peered through the mangrove leaves, the better to study the passengers' drizzled, blurred faces. A child looking for and gathering words, images, sounds, moods, colors, conversations, and shapes, which she would store in one of the, sh sh one of the shelves of her soul to retrieve later and reflect upon. Every day, in secret, she went to and stood by the portals of this sea, her sea. She was waiting for someone. The girl now moved the kitten from her right to her left shoulder. Its extra large blue eyes followed the dance of eight golden dragonflies hovering close by. Thunder, the dow drew parallel to the girl and she fixated on a man in a cream colored suit who was slumped over the vessel's edge. She was about to cackle at his discomfort when a high and hurried voice intruded. Ayana! Her surveillance of the man was interrupted as lightning split the sky. Ayana! It was her mother, Ayana. At first the little girl froze, then she crouched low, almost kneeling in the water and stroked her kitten. She whispered to it, Hi, Duru, don't mind, she can't see us. Ayana was supposed to be recovering from a morning asthma attack. Bimu Nira, her mother, had rubbed clove oil over her tightened chest and stuffed the all ailment treating black kalonji seeds into her mouth. They had sat together naked under a blanket while a pot of steaming herbs, which included eucalyptus and mint, decongested their lungs. Ayana had gulped down air and blocked her breath to swallow six full tablespoons of cod liver oil. She had gurgled a bitter concoction and, be and been lulled to sleep by her mother's dulcet, do, do, do. She had woken up to the sounds of her mother at work, the tinkle of glass, brass and ceramic, the aroma of rose, clove, langi langi, and moonflower, and the lilts of women's voices inside her mother's rudimentary home-based beauty salon. Ayana had tried. 
She had half napped until a high-pitched sea wind pierced and scattered her reverie. She had heard far off thunder, but she had pinned herself to the bed until the persistent beckon of the storm proved irresistible. Then she rolled out of bed, arranged extra pillows to simulate her body, and covered these with sheets. She squeezed out of a high window and shimmied down drain pipes clamped to the crumbling coral wall. On the ground, she found the kitten she had rescued from a muddy drain several days ago, stretched out on their doorstep. She picked it up and planted it on her right shoulder, dashed off to the seafront, and finally swung north to the mangrove section of the creek from where she could spy on the world unseen. Ayana! The wind cooled her face. The kitten purred. Ayana watched the dow. The cream-suited elderly stranger lifted his head. Their eyes connected. Ayana ducked, pressing into the mangrove shadows, her heart racing. How had that happened? Ayana! Her mother's voice was closer. Where's that child? Ayana! Must I talk to God? Ayana looked towards the boat and again at the blackening skies. She would never know what landed first, the boat or the storm. She remembered the eyes that had struck hers. Would their owner tell on her? She scanned the passageway, looking for those eyes again. The kitten on her shoulder pressed its face into her neck. Ayana! Hakia Mungu! Ay! The threat-drenched contralto came from the bushes to the left of the mangroves. Ay, mwanangu! Bona wanitesa! Too close. The girl abandoned her cover, splashed through the low tide to reach open sands. Ayana scrambled from stone to stone with a kitten clinging to her neck. She dropped out of sight. Thank you. Thank you.